Hello, this is Ian McNeese, and welcome to the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Hello. Hello. I swear to you, Melanie, StreamYard's possessed. It's really just like when you try to hit a button and will not let it go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. We have a special edition today, and we welcome special guest Ian McNeese. You know him better as Winston Churchill. And today, live, you get to chat with the man himself, Ian McNeese, and his plethora of appearances in God knows how many things that he's done out there, from Ace Ventura to HBO's Rome to Doc Martin, just a ton of stuff out here. But before we begin, let's go ahead and introduce the panel that will be interviewing him. And you get to be part of the panel today here at the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. I notice I don't have a background. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> let's go ahead and bring on the panelists out there. And we're going to welcome the lovely Melanie Dean. How are you doing there, Melanie? Thank you for coming. Doing quite well. Happy Saturday to everybody. Uh, neat little fun show for a Saturday. So if you have nothing else better to do, stick around and watch our little interview. It's got, I cannot wait. It's going to be a fun hour. Plus. It will be an awesome hour out there. At the, and it's actually uh, Ian's second time on the show. Yes. It's been quite a few years, so you have to catch up every night. It's like the family reunion, and you have to come back here and start talking. Speaking of start talking, we're going to bring in uh, the Cosmic Mask, Nick Smith. How are you doing there, Nick? I am doing great. Yeah, I'm so excited. And thank you to Ian and our other host for being here. Uh, can't wait to grill Ian with lots of questions. You're going to grill him. We're going to all grill him. And especially for our wow, Lovingly. Out, right? <laughs> Lovingly grilling. Yeah, it'll be a sweet grilling. And speaking of grilling, for those of you who are out in the comments, please make sure you put in your questions in for Ian today. We we got a, we got a while beforehand, and we're going to get to your comments. Uh, speaking of comments, hello there, Professor Alita Black. I think this is your first time here. I've never seen you before, but if you have, welcome. And if this is your returning, thanks for coming back on the show out there. Speaking of which, the lovely Simon Fisher Becker. How are you doing, Simon? Thank you for coming. I, I'm on. fine. I'm sorry. I got a little distracted because I just had a sheep run past my window. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, I, I, I won't scare it yet because the. Because at the other end, there's no U-turn. So, uh, well, you'll be coming back, won't it, Simon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry, sorry about oh, that. Boy. Is this a common occurrence, or...? <laughs> is this... no, well, apparently not. Well, well I live in the country now, and so we do get... Ah. The other day, I had an alpaca, so there you go. Ooh. Oh, my God. <laughs> they come Where and visit live me. You just had these random things coming. <laughs> <laughs> So it's very sweet. I just said, tell my friends in Florida, hi, hey, what are you doing? Oh, no, a sheep ran past my window this morning. So there you go. <laughs> Simon is a country boy now. <laughs> well, I have no segue, and I was going to use a sheep, but that's not, that would be rude. <laughs> so without further ado, let me introduce you to our guest, uh, our special guest, Mr. Ian McNeese. How you doing, Ian? It's been a while. It's been a while. How long has it been? How long has it been? I have no idea. I think you were, uh, I think this was during around, if I'm not mistaken, was it COVID? Maybe. Goodness me. I must have been in short trousers in those days. A little more. <laughs> <laughs> and then we all had to buy pants again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
And why, I guess it could be worse. I mean, you could have sheep running right through your window out there. In fact, uh, we have a picture of Simon's window right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. Yes, very good. As yes. everybody, the guys are going, that, that's bad. There you go. Very mm. bad. Very bad. <laughs> Ian, I mean, it's been, what, what, what's this COVID? How, what have you been doing since um, the coof, as everybody tries to hide it? Well, out? do you know what? The thing is this. Very sadly, we came to the end of Doc Martin. So uh, Ten years, right? it was in July. Uh, that was the end of uh, Series 10. And we've been going since 2004, so it was nearly 20 years. It was extraordinary. So to see the end of the back of it, I mean, that's it, all gone now. Series 10 finally sort of uh, finished in, in uh, Port Isaac. We had to say goodbye to everybody. Rather mm -hmm. sad in many ways because uh, I love going down there and spending the summer down there, I have to say. So very sad to see it go. Uh, will there be another one? I don't think so. I, I mean, I think they've run the course. But never say never. Maybe there'll be a little, you know, Christmas special edition sometime. Mm -hmm. well, you, guys, you guys were at it for 10 years. Didn't you buy a house down there, or am I mistaken? 20 years, 20 years. It was, 20 years? It was, I'm like, years. Years. We did it every other year, so it was like 20 years. So it started in 2004. So it was a long, long time. So you've done 10 series, but been in that same location for 20. God. That's right. Yeah, if you're going to be stuck somewhere, years, that's a beautiful yeah. place, too. That's a beautiful place. Oh, it's a place. fantastic place. It's a really lovely place. And we were very fortunate in the fact is that you know so many people came to see us when we were from all over the world i mean americans and latvians goodness me japanese you know they all turned up you know to see where we made doc martin so it was really nice to meet them all in the village and we would we just like playing to live theater we would be making the series mm. in, the, in the port harbor and you know there'd be two or three four hundred people there just watching us like watching paint dry because it takes so long to do anything <laughs> <laughs> you get applause after the scene Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, speak up a bit. We can't hear you. Yeah, <laughs> that used to happen a lot. It'd be tough to do a spoiler alert when everybody in the neighborhood is looking at you. Phil. I'm just like, what's going on next week? Well, we'll just ask the neighbors. <laughs> it's just go around out there, and we know. Like, oh, well, they know it out there. Um, yeah, that was Doc Martin there, and uh, you. Uh, oh, there he is. There we go. 20 years as uh, Bert Large out there. And there's Bert actually Large. a Facebook page for Bert from so there is. Having an there entertaining is. time. I'll the try Bert to Large Lovers Group. You must come along and say hello. Over 5,000 women now. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, you can. Woman of all ages. There's my son, Joe <laughs> Absalom. Yeah, he's just been on tour with a, with a, with a play all over England, Shawshank Redemption, in which he played oh, the yeah. lead. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's... There's Mr. Clunes there. I, I I could sworn that I saw an interview. Somebody was interviewing him, and um, somebody I don't know, so either on the uh, on the cast or the uh, or, or behind the scenes or on the crew, they were asking if if Martin Clunes was anything like his character, and goes absolutely not. <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. I, I mean, because um, I mean, he's such he, I mean, he's the most friendliest, warmest guy you can meet, and uh, he loves dogs. Loves all animals, so all that business with the dog in the show, which is, he hates the dog in the show, but really, he's got about four or five dogs of his own, and he would stop, he would stop filming, you know, um, if anybody came down with a dog, he would stop filming, talk to the dog, talk to the owners, I'm, I'm sure that people used to rent them at the top of the village, bring him down just to make sure he'd stop and talk to them, <laughs> have a dog on the day. See, I've been trying to watch the series because I actually caught it on our local PBS, Yes. And I fell instantly in love with it. I knew you were in there. I and I started watching. The problem is, it's our local PBS. So I think I was watching like series five, and then it went right. to series six. Yeah, they don't run things sequentially. And they no, went to series good. two. <laughs> really? So I was out. I, yeah. Well, it, they do. Yeah, it depends upon you know how much money they because they're publicly supported. They're not. You know, the good news, good. the good news is that now PBS are being are going to be able to show series nine and ten, which they weren't mm -hmm. able to a while ago. So you can now watch nine and ten on PBS, which is good. Right. I mean, the what happened was is that uh, well, I, I won't spoil it, but we are we know they had a kid, and then all of a sudden they the had two. Episode, I don't I don't even know that part. 
He's all over the place. Very next episode, they were back to fighting. <laughs> yeah, you have, to, you have to either find it on your thoughts or watch it on TV. Yeah, maybe that's the best way to see it. I have to say, out of place. I can't watch something like out of place. So we're watching Bert get younger and younger. As a bigger <laughs> nice. <younger>, probably. <laughs> Oh, he had a beard, and then it was. Would lose weight one like, season, oh, and then put it back on again the next. Yeah, mm -hmm. up and down like a yo-yo. <laughs> Paul Stringer says, "I'm in the middle of creating a TARDIS simulator." Then. And so is PBS with Doc Martin. It was very timey wimey. Yes. Yeah, so, well, at least watching it on PBS out there. Yes. And today's episode is brought to you by Cameo, and uh, let's go ahead and put it up up there. Uh, Ian's Cameo. If you want to get your own Cameo, uh, let me, I got it. I think I have it up here. Hang on one second. I'll show everybody what this looks like. Oh, well, you know, I have Simon's, but I'll put them up up there. And I'm sorry, streaming. I, I, Melanie, I even rebooted my computer. So what, like, while Christian is trying to figure out his yeah. the, all the technical <laughs> aspects of, of StreamYard, our, our two of, of our esteemed guests here each have uh, a Cameo. So yeah. you can go on to Cameo.com. Uh, Ian's is Cameo.com, then slash Ian McNeese. There we go. And then Simon's is slash, again, Cameo.com slash Fisher Becker one. So those will get you direct links. However, you can always go on to cameo.com and search these lovely gentlemen's names and yeah. it will pull them up. Good Lord. Is that what yeah, it looks like? Now? That's what it looks yeah. like now. This is Simon yeah. and I'll bring up Ian's in just a second there. The, the, um, if you want to book uh, Simon for any personal videos, this is weddings, happy anniversary, somebody in your business or somebody who's just a big fan who wants, you know, uh, you can surprise them with just a little bit of an audio visual of your These favorite. Fantastic. Movie birthday gifts they make some uh, father's day gifts mother's day gifts anniversaries anything if you want to surprise that significant other that friend who's a big fan of simon or ian you can bring them up uh through cameo and they can personalize anything for you mm -hmm. um 35 for simon let me um i think ian was on the past page hang on a second hold mm -hmm. me no nah, it wasn't okay <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Ian McShane will come up now. What's it? <laughs> <laughs> there he is. No, it wasn't. You know how long it took me to get Ian McNeese, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can make a purchase online, um, and as you can see on the uh, on the site out there, and there you go. Oh, the great Ian great. has props. I have props. <laughs> He's using props. Hang a second here. Look at that. And a beard at one point. That was a COVID beard. Yeah. Look at that. I remember. Well, you did have the beard. You did have the beard. I do remember that. Mm. So check them out out there, Simon and uh, Ian. Uh, Simon, Ian, and Ian. Simon, Ian, and Ian. Check them out out there, Simon and Ian out there. So yes, I, am, I need to make an a, I need to make an apology <laughs> to someone called Dave because he recently sent me a request on Cameo, but it turned out what he wanted me to do was a roast. And what he asked me to say was really quite vulgar. So I thought I'd been hacked. So I deleted So I deleted it. So, <laughs> and then Cambio contacted me to ask why I deleted it. And so I explained that. But uh, there we go. Oh, so Dave, <laughs> you could do your request again. It wasn't meant to add yeah. a maliciousness. It was a yes. miscommunication. Yes. I had a lovely Which, cameo uh, uh, from, so from this, uh, this family in... Uh, Montana, who said that uh, their dad, right, was a uh -huh. uh, was a um, cowboy who used to come in from the range. He was looking after Black Angus uh, sheep in Montana, uh, Black Angus cows. And every night he would come in and watch an episode of Doc Martin. I can't believe that. A cowboy in Montana would come in at yeah. 6 o'clock and watch this show. It was amazing. It was wonderful. You got so some cool. podcaster in Florida now that watches that show, and he, hopefully, when PBS or whoever is going to be distributing proper, so I can watch it in order instead of yeah, exactly. Buy the DVD; they'll be cheap. <laughs> they'll be cheap. <laughs> I got to carry it on the phone. I can't. I can't put my DVD on this thing. <laughs> so now, I gotta, now I want to purchase one from Simon's just to see if I can get a rogue sheep in the background. Yeah. Possibly a llama. I'll see what I can do. Uh, okay. I can arrange. <laughs> There's me and like Simon. The, I like the one on the left. I'm really upset. <laughs> Hello, Felicia. <laughs> Hello, Felicia. Hey, 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 yeah, 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 our website, girl. <laughs> Welcome down there. So, yes. Yes. 
No, go ahead, Nick. Go for it, Nick. Go I was going to say, I was born in Bristol and I would go to Cornwall every year for holiday. Um, what's the one thing that you miss the most about that area? Because it is gorgeous. I think it's the pastures. The, the pasties? The yes. pasties, yeah. The pasties are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite thing. Yeah, pasties. A, a good pasty is hard to find. Got a cream, of course, with the uh, with the scones. Put your jam and cream on. Which way do you do? Do you put jam on first or cream on first? You have to put the jam on first. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's the way to go. You see, Bristol is not too far from Port from uh, from Cornwall, is it? It's just down the M5. Right. It's yeah. Two hours. That's all. And I was interested in the Taunton connection as well. Did you do any acting training there? Or was it school? Yes, school? I was in school. I went to school in Taunton, mm. Somerset, and used to come up to, which is brilliant. Uh, uh, the school had a, um, a big theater section, and uh, they arranged for us to come and see the uh, the um, uh, plays at the Bristol Old Vic. That's oh, where I first I fell in love with theater by going with the school up to see the plays at the Bristol Old Vic Theater. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to, um, Melanie, let's go to a commercial break just real fast. We'll go ahead and take care of that. When we return, we'll continue our discussion with Ian McNeese. Don't forget to put your, uh, put your comments in the chat. If you have any questions for Ian himself, please type away. We'll be right back uh, and we'll continue our discussion with Ian McNeese. When we return, please continue to stay logged on, tuned in, become part of the legend. Here we go. <laughs> We are touring. We are a touring acoustic duo crashing kitchens around the country. We go from house to house every Friday night and we create music, we create food, a good time, we stream it live and we do it for free. So now we're just really kind of like trying to develop it and build a community group that people believe in, then they'll help us. So we played from our rehearsal room, we played from the bathroom, thankfully that didn't catch on. I probably played guitar in my room, not for anyone, in front of anyone, nobody heard, for probably about 10 years. And then one Friday night, we played from the kitchen. It's the main place people wanna be. It's where the food is, it's where the drink is, it's where the best lighting is. You can go to any party and I guarantee you, the kitchen is gonna be popping. Our ultimate goal I think would be to crash kitchens every Friday all around the world. Meet the doctor. I'm the doctor. But not the one you were expecting. All right, sexy. It's time to go home. Doctor Who Velocity, streaming now. Oh, brilliant. It's hard to believe that in the 56 year history of the greatest sci-fi television show in the English language, there has never been a fan guide to Doctor Who. The official books might give you what they think you need to know, but only a guide written by a true fan will give you what you really want to know. Join Whovian, the brilliant Mackenzie Floor as she takes you on an intensive journey inside the world of the first female Doctor. In the Binge Watcher's Guide to Doctor Who, Season 11. Right, let's get a shift on. And 
and ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. My name is Christian Basil, and that's not bad. We're here with guest star Ian McNeese, uh, better known as Winston Churchill from Doctor Who, and you've seen him in a lot of other uh, TV shows, movies, episodes, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, uh, HBO's, uh, HBO's Rome. Uh, I'm doing this off the top of my head, I'm sorry. <laughs> and of course, we were just talking about Doc Martin. Yeah. My, my brain is just completely fried. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He's been the TV uh, version of Dune. I'm really doing this off the top of my head. I'm sure there's mm. a, a lot more. Yeah, go on to this IMDb. You'll find a lot out there. Um, Simon, did you have any questions for Ian? Well, um, okay. You know, this is the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. What, uh, what Ian, what was your first experience of Doctor Who? Uh, it was uh, Tom Tom Baker, of course. Tom Baker was my Doctor Who, um, I, and, and I was very excited when I I got the chance to actually work with Tom Baker um, in Big Finish. Um, those those um, those uh, books, which were the mm. radio and the audio books, uh, Big Big Finish, and they were normally done in London um, at a studio in London. But this one was at a village somewhere outside of London that I had to take a train down to about an hour and a half on a train, and then I got picked up a taxi, taken to this little studio in the middle of nowhere, and I realized the reason we were down there was because Tom Baker, who was going to be in the uh, in the book with me, was just uh, down the road. So he, he required, he didn't want to come up to London. He said, look, I'll do it at this, you know, at this little studio down the road. And of course, so he turned up in his pajamas. With a cup of coffee through the door. He didn't even put his clothes on. He'd just come, he'd come out of my kitchen on. He walked through the door in his pajamas and we did the show in his pajamas. It was the most wonderful thing. So great working with Tom Baker. Do you have it's a very confident. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the only um, big finish because a lot of people don't know that Winston Churchill, his life continues into the big finish articles, including, um, what was it? Let me, I, I got that backwards. The Oncoming Storm. Look at that. Look at that. I love that. Well done. Well found. My little Doctor Who books. Uh, Doctor Who. Doctor Who Churchill years. I love that. That's uh, good start. I think uh, it's just it's just hard to keep up with the amount of big finisher is out there. And it's oh, it's, it's huge. It's, it's enormous. It's just really incredible. As, uh, you also did something with Sylvester? That's right. There it is. And Paul McGann, too, I think. Yeah, uh, let me find that one. Yeah, Paul McGann, the finest. Yeah, 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 wow. And you were Churchill featuring, in that I one as that. well. Featuring Ian McGee's, I love that. Of Nicola course. Walker, of course, she speaks now. I had Paul McGann, there we go. And then you did oh. one that wasn't Churchill. You were with um, you were with Sheridan and Paul in this one called The Immortal Beloved. Yes, you, you are so good, aren't you? Aren't you wonderful? You got all these things up there. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Well, I'm going to listen to him if I get a chance. I'm very impressed. I'm I'm so far behind. I think I'm behind William Hartnell somewhere. <laughs> if this was the lineage, <laughs> far, if there's anything behind William Hartnell, I just I'm that far up. I have to like pick and choose. And plus, it was um, what was it? It was uh, Nick Briggs. I said, Nick asked me one time. He goes, "Where are you?" And I said, "I have no clue." I mean, this is not even linear. This is this is. Yeah. It's not like Doctor Who, and then. There's Torchwood and Sarah Jane Smith, so you can keep up with them. There's Torchwood and Sarah Jane and all these things that are going off simultaneously. And I like the fact that it does extend the life of the character and giving you new dimensions with well, Winston does. Churchill we never had. It's really good. It's really good. I'm so lucky to have it, really. And the I must best say, part of the whole thing is the food. Simon will tell you as well. I mean, that they had the most wonderful chef. So yes, everybody talks stuff. about this. When you go to Big Finish, the only thing they talk about is the food that you have at lunchtime, which was like a gourmet chef they used to have. So we'd all turn up and not worry about what we were doing. Say, oh, good, let's have lunch quick now. Let's have it now. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> so the, the the quality of uh, the uh, the Big Finish productions is superb, and yeah, I'm, it is, I'm, isn't it? I'm I'm so chuffed to have done a few. And I've done a Dorian has returned with Big Finish. Dorian Moldovar. So, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to hear more of this. <laughs> <laughs> with Big Finish, uh, there's the 11th Doctor Chronicles, uh -huh. uh, in which there's a complete storyline with the Doctor and Dorian. Well, and that's then great. there's. 
Then there's the spin-off series called Jenny, the Doctor's daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. And I did a, a, a few before. And different characters. Uh, that were not Dorian related. <laughs> but uh, so, as Ian says, I've had the experience of the wonderful culinary delights that Big Finish used to offer. But more recently, uh, I've been um, recording them from home. Mm. Uh, Tony has oh. uh, the complete setup. So oh, okay. they've done it remotely. The first time I did it was because it was during COVID. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so. Um, they did it, and it was amazing. We we're all all linked up. So, so now yeah. when now when other production companies say, "Oh, and we're not sure the quality that we'll get from your own home studio," I just say, "Well, big finish, and the BBC are happy with it." Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> exactly, so, you can give them a technical listing, and they're probably yeah. going, "Uh, this is on par, if not better, than what the equipment we have." Yeah. Yeah. So. so we're good. Um, and you can do it in your pajamas if you like. I mean, yes. you, can, yes. you, can do that. Yeah. you could certainly do it in your pajamas at home, couldn't you? For goodness yeah. sake, yes. Yeah. And Simon will see this outside like... of his window as we're yes. recording. Oh, yes. <laughs> Simon in his pajamas. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, Ian. Yes. Uh, one of my real delights of Doctor Who, being associated with Doctor Who, is all this spin offs, the conventions, and things. And so when we get to talk in the green rooms at certain events, we find out that we all have something in common. And in, in one conversation with you, uh, we found out we both appeared in a TV film called An Ungentlemanly Act. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so, yes. Uh, so do you find, have you met up with certain people at certain times and then found you had something in common? You appeared yes, in the same well, production yes, or something? Yes, yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. Goodness me, you've called me on the hop. I can't think of anything at the moment. But, uh, <laughs> right. sorry, sorry to throw that at you, but it was a, it was a question that just came to mind. So. Not at all, not at all. No, no, but, uh, but that was extraordinary, that piece of work. That was about the Falklands War. We actually had to go to the Falklands to actually make it. We had to oh, and, alas, I, I didn't get that, sir. I didn't yeah, get we had, that. We, uh, uh, with the wonderful Bob Peck as well. So, uh, yes. And, uh, and uh, Ian Richardson, who played the governor. It was yes. fantastic. We, we flew from Bryce Norton, which is uh, sort of a, which was a, um, a plane to take off with the RAF. We had to go with an RAF plane to Bryce Norton, and I remember we got to Bryce, uh, we got to the Falklands, and we had to go through the army section to get into it. And we said, "Don't go anywhere near the beaches because it's still mined." Oh, so, no. thank oh. you, my goodness me, that's 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 pretty. That's pretty nerve-wracking, really. Yeah. Because yes. it, was still, it was still a mind, a mind place. No, anyway, yeah. moving on. Let's move on. <laughs> well, we I got a Bob Peck in Edge of Darkness. That's correct? right. We, yeah. we we both were in that together as well. Yes. No, that was one of the first things I did, which just took off. It just won all these BAFTAs and stuff. It was a fantastic show, Edge of Darkness, and really. I mean, ahead of its time, and then of course the director went on to do Goldeneye and. Uh, yeah. All those other Bond movies, uh, Martin Campbell, a wonderful director from New Zealand. Yeah, oh. did you expect it to be a breakthrough for you? You know, when I, I didn't know at the time. Well, you see, the thing is, the thing, when you make something like that, you have no idea how it's going to turn out. You think mm. it's pretty good, but it was, I, mean, I had no idea how, 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 how it would take off. Uh, and I always remember it, it finished, and I heard it was going to be repeated, uh, and uh, so. I rang the office and I said, I hear that um, the Edge of Darkness is being repeated. He said, oh, yes, yes. Uh, and she gave me the date. And I said, well, well, that's next week. And they said, yes. And I said, really? Next week? And it had been, it'd been on for six weeks. You know, every other week it would have been on. And then suddenly it was going to re be repeated over two nights, one block of three and another block of three. And it was incredible. And it was the first thing that had ever happened because it had been so successful. An amazing piece of work. It was must see TV. Must see TV, absolutely. Yeah, we had to see you. Yes, I played an MI5 character hmm. called Harcourt. Wonderful. So, Ian. So much work after that playing MI5 officers. People, <laughs> people came in and said, Would you like to do that? Oh, yes, of course I would. Thank you. <laughs> 
So my question is, yes. uh, what is the shortest, uh, it's a, it's another memory question, but mm. what is the, sh uh, the, if you can recall, what the shortest amount of time you've had given a script and then told to perform, whether it's theater, television, film? Wow, wow. The shortest amount of time. Have you ever had that that instance where you're like, okay, and here you go, and you're on? Goodness me, I can't think. Simon, has that happened to you at all or not? Uh, well, uh, my my Doctor Who story with that is we were filming um, A Good Man Goes to War, and uh, some girl came over to me and she said, uh, Stephen wants to know, that's Stephen Moffat, <laughs> Stephen wants to know, uh, will you be happy to do a trailer for this episode? Hmm. So I said, yes, I'd be lovely. Um, she said, it'll be you and four other characters. I said, okay. Uh, I, I said, and uh, will there be time to rehearse? And she said, well, he hasn't written it yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but it'll be in my trailer when we finish tonight. And this was about half past five. I'd Ooh. finished, and it was about half past 10, half past 11. Got to the trailer. Uh, opened up this brown envelope to find this uh, two-page script. And it was me and three other characters. The three other characters were headless monks. So in other words, it was a monologue. Oh, so it's just uh, you talking. Uh, yes, uh, uh, to me talking to these headless monks. And uh, we were on set filming at nine o'clock the following morning. <gasps> so yes. a, sleep, a sleepless I mean, night. Couldn't yeah. do that. <laughs> Coming back to your question, I do remember that there was a there was a TV film called the um, Wimbledon Poisoner, and I do remember this very very well because um, I, I got a little um, note from my agent saying um, one of the scenes had been cut from the show. So I turn up on the day to film, and I, I notice on the call sheet that the film that had been cut, the scene that had been cut was back in, and I said, "No, no, that's already been cut, surely." And they said, "No." No, it's in this afternoon. And I hadn't learnt it. So yeah. instantly, what you're talking about is I had to, over lunch, try and learn a sort of page and a half dialogue scene, which I thought had been cut. And it was a nightmare, I have to say. Oh, no. I think at one yeah. point, I think they put something up in front of me. There was a screen where they'd written some dialogue on, something like that. But it, yeah. it was the worst afternoon of my life, I have to say. Yes. It, was not, it was not the best thing. I to, but yeah. having been told it's been cut, and then you're doing mm -hmm. it, yes. it's yes. another thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, a similar experience as I had was with corporate videos. Uh, and uh, with corporate videos, you very often have to speak their technical garbage mm -hmm. uh, as if you've been speaking it for 20 years. And then you learn it and you're thinking, OK, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. You get there and they said, oh, we've changed it. <laughs> we've changed it. So they give you the new script and the changes are really very minor changes, but then your brain plays tricks with you. Of course. You're, speak, you're, 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 you're speaking the new lines. Yes, I've been down and that then road saying, as well. No, Absolutely. no, that's the old script. <laughs> yes, no, I'm totally it's, with it's, you. Uh, it's horrendous. Yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the tricks these people play on us actors. You know, quite, and, often, quite often you'll find that you'll turn up to do filming that day and suddenly pages will appear in front of you from the writer who's decided overnight that he wants to change the script. And you've had, yes. you know, two or three weeks to learn this stuff. And suddenly, yes. in the morning, you're handed, a, you know, a, a few lines of dialogue that have been changed. And it really is by the seat of your pants that you've got to do it. It really is. It's yeah. tough stuff. But that's why we're paid so much money. That's why. That's <laughs> why. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, another, another example I can give is I was filming an episode of a series called Getting On, which I don't know if it's been got over to the States, but it was with Joanna Scanlon uh, and Joe Brand. And I'd learned all the I'd learned all the dialogue for the day I was filming. And it was a three day uh, production. And yeah. uh, they then came out to me, oh we've got a technical problem. We can't do today's things. Are you okay if we do scene blah blah blah? Which is something which was not planned until day three. There now, you as go. it happens there you go. Right. Yeah, yeah, oh. as it happens, I had read through and I did notice that there was one scene in particular where uh, my character was quite prominent. So I did look at that at the time, but I didn't sit and learn it properly. But, mm -hmm. God, 
That does me. <laughs> that no. that is a cure for constipation. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> the best answer I got for that from an actor was "Go with the flow." I'm just going to go with the flow. No. 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 <laughs> that was a third line. That was a third yes. expression. The first hearing. Uh -huh. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. Uh, but it is. It's better. It is always wise when you get a script to read it all the way through and mm -hmm. check what you've got to say and work out how to prioritise your learning. Really. But yeah, God dear, that did. I think I, I think I mentioned in um, our last episode with Richard Ashton. I was I was telling him I was part of. Uh, our first generation of the Orlando Shakespeare Young, and they called it the Young Company. They had high schoolers doing Shakespeare. And yeah. um, we did it for libraries, we did it for schools and stuff to get kids to get more interest in the Shakespeare. Right. Well, we had ended our run and then there was a two month gap and uh, mm -hmm. the teacher at the time, I forgot her name, she recalled us two months later and says, we're gonna do one more, we're gonna do it for a homeless shelter. And it was interesting because there was no stage or anything. It was just like we were like, there were like brick rocks and everything. And we just did it then and there. I forgot to reread the script. I thought it was going to be like a bicycle. I just get back on and I'll have my dialogue all of a sudden. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> and I get on stage and I'm just like, there's my line. I'm just like, uh, and apparently mm. I'm not the only one because we all improv to that entire thing. What play was it you were doing? Um, in Summer Night Stream, I was Peter Quince. All right, Quint, lovely. And you improved it. <laughs> well, I mean, we th there were some things you remember once you stare mm -hmm. when you hear the dialogue, yeah. it kicks back yes. in. Yeah. But then there are some things you forgot, and there were some like old habits that I would say names wrong, or I would say the, this word in place of this word, and those old habits came back. And the, and the, it was it was an improv, but as long as the kids had a good time, that's all we, that matters. That's all that, that matters. Moment. So that, that's what we did. I was just like, I remember that out there. Go but uh, also another thing I experience is I hate the word action. Because as soon as they go, like, action, really? my brain goes, <laughs> <laughs> everything completely empty. It's tricky, Simon. It's tricky, tricky. Tricky of yeah. the filming and you don't like the word action. Goodness me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just, everything goes... Oh, but it's uh, it's it's. Try not to panic. Just take a deep uh, breath. Oh, try not to so panic. It'd be easier for them instead instead of saying the word action, just say forget. Hey. <laughs> <Yes. Okay. laughs> no, there was an occasion. There was a guy. I think I did in Norway, where the director kept on saying, "Action, be funny." <laughs> <laughs> action, be funny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, that's great. No pressure. Was, uh, no pressure. No yeah, pressure. Anyway. Okay. Yes. I'm an okay. I, did a, um, I did a film with Maggie Smith and Bob Hoskins uh, called The Lonely Passion of Judith Lowe. We had a wonderful mm -hmm. director called Jack Clayton who'd done uh, lots of movies, including that one with Robert Redford. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one it was now where, where he plays um, um, that very glitzy guy. Anyway, so... Um, um, so, so Jack Clayton says to me, oh, okay, and so what you do is you come out of this door and uh, you're just about to go up the stairs, you do something funny, and then I, I thought to myself, this is what a wonderful piece of direction. You come out of the door, you're just about to go up the stairs, you do something funny, and then you go up. And I thought to myself, what, what do I do? What do I do? So am I going to sort of go blah, like this? <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, of course I did nothing. But it's crazy. It's crazy. You do something funny and then you go on. So there you go. Oh. I just like somebody telling you. you the Great Gatsby. Funny. That's what it was. <laughs> Jack Gatsby, oh, a wonderful yeah. film, The Great Gatsby with Robert Redford. What a wonderful ladies, director. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going back to a commercial break. When we return, we're going to continue our discussion with Ian McNeese. I'm here with Nick, Simon, and Melanie today. And um, we're so honored to have Ian here. Uh, please continue to stay logged on, tune in. We will be right back. Stand by, please. Hopefully this button works again. You have more options than ever before when choosing a film, a television, or internet series, a book to curl up with, or even a radio show or podcast. 
get to know the people who are creating for you. The Hanging With Web Show, hosted by award-winning author and journalist G.W. Pometry, is the Internet's fastest-growing web talk show series. The Hanging With Web Show features professional, yet casual, in-depth interviews with creative arts and entertainment pros. Meet the people behind a digital revolution in creating more quality content than ever before in the history of media. Find the Hanging With Web Show on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, or simply go to www.hangingwithshow.com. That's www.h-a-n-g-i-n-with-show.com. Famous. Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at FFF Comics. Hi, my name is Jamie Engel, critically acclaimed author of The Toilet Papers, Places to Go While You Go, a short story collection suited to match your bathroom needs. Only have to go a little? No problem. I've got stories under a thousand words for you. Far from pooping? I've got you covered. With stories over 5,000 words to keep you occupied while your latrine stays occupied. And that's not all. The Toilet Papers is endorsed by the fine folks from Squatty Potty, the stool for better stools. But don't take my word for it. See what Dookie the Squatty Potty Unicorn has to say on YouTube. You won't be disappointed. Well, I've got to go, but you can grab your copy of The Toilet Papers on Amazon in ebook or print, or get an autographed copy from me at therightangle.com. And don't worry. I promise I'll wash my hands first. The toilet papers. You might just stay in the bathroom longer than you need to. One of the great things, Ian, is we can see everybody backstage when I run the commercials. And I, I just get a personal kick out of watching people try to react for the very first time when they see the toilet papers commercial. <laughs> it's like, oh, what? is that for real? Yes, it's for real. Yes, it's Jamie and Just Jake, the movie coming out, whatever. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Legend Traveling Titus. My name is Christian Bays. I'm here with Nick, Melanie, and Simon. We are here with special guest Ian McNeese, and continue our discussion out there. Ian, with everything you've been through, favorite backstage thing. <laughs> what? What? Well, I don't want to say accident or incident or something, but any memory. I mean, well, I, I, mean well, I have to say that I mean, working with uh, Jim Carrey on Ace Ventura: When Nature Calls was an absolute hoot because what happens is that when you um, uh, on those big movies, um, it takes two or three hours to do a lighting change when they turn around and do something. So that's mm -hmm. a long time. You go back to your trailer and you sort of sit down, have a cup of coffee or you read a book or something like that. Carrie stays on the set and entertains the troops. Mm -hmm. He will do funny walks. He will do comedian jokes. He can do also, he can sing songs. He can do music, but he just, he just entertains all the technicians who are doing the lighting changes and stuff like that. He never stops. He's on 24 hours a day. So, I mean, what a character. And, uh, it, it was while we were making the movie that, that he, he got the first $20 million for a movie. He got it for uh, the cable guy, right? Yeah. And it was a big sort of, it was a big article in, in, in Newsweek saying first actor to get $20 million. Of course, they all got it afterwards. You know, they all demanded it afterwards, you know, Tom Hanks and everybody, and, you know, get in line for the $20 million a picture. He was the first one, right? So I go to see him. I said, Jim, what is it like to be paid? $20 million for a movie. And he said, you know what? It's like getting a golden birthday cake every day of your life. But I thought, okay, mm -hmm. I can go with that. 
I'll have some of that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Extraordinary. So no, you know, just watching him perform was uh, a backstage treat for me. I have to say, and uh, he called me Reaction Jackson McNeese because I, <laughs> all I could do was, you know, he'd do all this funny stuff. Of course, there was no script involved. It was all improvised on the day, so I just had to work out when I thought he'd finished yes. his bit. So I would. <laughs> I didn't trample on his stuff because and, and so I, because I did that, I think it's a, a reaction, Jackson McNeese. You're doing a great job, baby. Doing a great job because I didn't trample on him. So that was that was something anyway, which is God bless him. I have to say for that. I've only come to see the Doctor Who thing. And I see the ads and made me check on my water mat. That would be Jamie's Jamie Ingalls ad. <laughs> Let's be shadow. I want to get a copy of that toilet paper. I can tell you that now. I wrote this down. The toilet paper. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get a copy of that. I can tell you. <laughs> Jamie will be very happy. Yeah, no, I'm getting it. Oh, my goodness. Going for that. Yeah, so I'll get the toilet paper when I'm a little more flush. <laughs> oh. Very good, Simon. Very good. Top of the tree. Top of the card. So, Ian, I grew up seeing your face everywhere and all the TV shows, uh, Cat Size, Call Me Mr. Boone, Minder, oh, Love, God, Joy. Yes, all those ones. Yes. It was always wonderful to see you. We knew that you would give a great performance. I just wondered if you preferred, you know, those just one episode things or do you prefer, um, you know, larger roles basically i do know what I, I mean the thing is i mean i would take anything i was such an old tart really that it would <laughs> just have to turn up and you know coming up yes i'll do that i like that I, I mean but just working with cat eyes working with those women was great with all those gorgeous women so, so that was a lot of fun yeah so i've just been hugely fortunate that i never got trapped in one one angle uh you know i could also be i could play a plumber one week I could mm -hmm. play a sort of prime minister the next. I could play Winston Churchill. I could do this. I could do that. I could play a German Nazi. So I've been really fortunate in the fact that I played so many characters over the years. And you're right, in my early days, all those wonderful British TV shows that I was in, with some of Murders, Minder, Cat's Eyes, Boone, mm -hmm. all those wonderful things, which is great. So very, very fortunate, very lucky to have done all that work. How much of yourself do you think you bring in to those roles you know do you take the character and, and try to do something completely different yes no no i try the thing is i always try and make it a little quirky i always try to make it a little different from what it should be and, and so that's what i've really enjoyed doing over the years is, is the quirky stuff you know which is good recently I, I mean i've been very fortunate to uh i got an offer of a job recently to play um uh, uh alfred hitchcock Oh, which was oh. wonderful. There's going to be a new miniseries coming out about the life of Cary Grant. Oh, um, okay. Jason oh. Isaacs plays uh, Cary Grant. It's a four-part miniseries, and we just finished it a little while ago. And, and I play his director, Alfred Hitchcock, in that wonderful um, um, movie, um, you know, where the crop duster plane is coming over. Mm -hmm. and North, by North by Northwest. North by Northwest. Well, yeah, we actually recreated that. I didn't realize, but that scene was actually done in a studio. Uh, so so he's running uh, uh, through the yeah. studio and he, he really lands on the sort of, you know, on, on, on the wheat stuff. That, mm -hmm. so we recreated that in the studio with uh, Hitchcock talking to him with direction about what he should do next. So that was, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. More yeah. funny. Yeah, no, it was funny. <laughs> Ian, um, we, were yeah. Cool, cool, funny. we were talking to uh, Felicia earlier, and this is a picture she just sent me. Oh, uh, look. Felicia's in there. That's her. That's Kat. That. That's, That's her nice. gorgeous. That's lovely. That's also, a great backdrop. That's a great backdrop. It's a Wherever that backdrop. was, it's fantastic with a Dalek right by the side of it. Yeah, but personally, I like this picture the best. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder why, because that's <laughs> yours, isn't it? That is yeah, mine, it's and it's... It's not as um, it's not as blue as it was back then. It lost its. Uh, it lost its is it that big? Wow! That is that big. <laughs> That's fantastic. A little silvery. I remember that very well. Plus, uh, uh, we want to give some birthday shout outs. Today is August nineteenth, twenty twenty three. Want to give a shout out to the folks who have touched my TARDIS. Uh, Jonathan Franks from Star Trek: The Next Generation and Star Trek: The Card. Uh, he's got a birthday today, and tomorrow is mm -hmm. the trifecta of birthdays. Uh, 
starting with the late great Anthony Ainley, uh, also Sophie Aldred, all of this basically in the same series as well. And of course, you mentioned Sylvester McCoy. Uh, he gets a birthday today on August 20th out there. So happy birthday to all three of them. And uh, oh, that's great. Yep. They get a, all three of them have a birthday. And there's a fourth one. I just don't have a picture of him with the TARDIS. It's uh, Barnaby Edwards, who uh, he's a Dalek yes. operator. And he Absolutely. does finish his I know Barnaby very well. So all very four good. of them will get a birthday. Simon too. and I know Barnaby very well. Yes. In our convention days. Yes. Oh, okay. It's one of those you kind of. You guys, you guys kind of traveled and hit the same conventions over and over, yes. at least. Simon like, Wait a minute, I, I know who there was you a are. Time, there was a time when we would do at least, uh, I don't know, about 15 or 20 a year, did, did, didn't we, Simon, in the yes, old days? Yes, you know, yes. I mean, you did, you, anyway. did, you did me a favor at one point, Ian, because we had the same booker. And uh, he, uh, he, uh, he wanted to book you for a couple of things. And apparent, apparently, so he tells me. You said, well, I'll only do it if Simon does it. <laughs> and so we ended up going as a pair. We oh. went as a pair. Well, very nice, too. And it was very good. And I enjoyed our car journeys. And Ian really oh. is a tour, yeah. tour de force. Can keep us awake on long journeys. Wow. No, so, no, we did not have that. But thank you. Thank yes, you, Doctor Who, because it's taken us, both me and Simon, all over the yeah. world. We've appeared in Australia, New Zealand. Are all over America, so thank you very much. We've had the most wonderful time going Absolutely. from convention to convention and meeting all you people, which is great. And we've loved it. So, all those fans yeah. who have turned up and said hello to us, we thank you for buying our photographs. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, as you've been saying throughout the, the show, what, Tara, go ahead. I was, gonna, I was just going to say very quickly one, uh, one game that I, I often play is the six degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, if you know someone, work out who, how many steps you are to be being with somebody else, and of course, knowing Ian McNeese, my net has grown vastly. <laughs> Just the if you if you look at you look at Ian's uh, CV or resume, mm -hmm. uh, so knowing Ian, I now have a connection with everybody he's worked with. There you go. <clears throat> Right. But That's we great. also both we both have worked with Eileen Atkins. We have. Uh, who, yeah, delight. Uh, Eileen Atkins the played Dave. Ruth in Doc Martin. But and Dave, I did, Dave, I Eileen did, Atkins was still yeah. at eighty-seven. She's yes. still doing theatre. She's just completed a, t a yes. theatre show down in um, uh, Chichester. Extraordinary to learn all those yes. lines and still be that yes. good at eighty-seven. My God, she's a, yes. a tour de force, quite frankly. Well done. Yeah, she was. She was in a. Well done, in a, in a uh, she was in a play I was in, which was my very first West End uh, play. So that was a long, long time ago. So. Now, Ian, do you have, have an got, Amy have Simon? We got, um... my, my question do was going to actually have a question for both of you. Go on. Okay, uh, the question the is, do you have a preference between Fire theater, uh, Ian, or Ian, uh, theater, TV, or film? Well, it's funny this because um, in my early days, I did an awful lot of theater, mm -hmm. um, or a regional theater, and the Royal Shakespeare Company for three years as well, ending up on Broadway with nine hours of Nicholas Nickleby. So in the early days, I did a lot of theatre. And then I told my agents, I said, look, I've got kids now. I can't do theatre because it pays so badly. So can I please just do TV and film? So for 17 years, I didn't do any theatre. I just did TV and film. And then suddenly I got a phone call from my agent saying, look, you've had an offer. I said, oh, that's nice. She said, it's from the National Theatre. I said, no, 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 hammer. I can't do theater. So hang on. It's the play Winston Churchill in a play about Harold Macmillan. And Jeremy Irons is playing Harold Macmillan. And I thought, goodness me, after all this time, shall I go back to the National Theater and do this? It's too good a thing not to mm -hmm. let this out on a play Winston Churchill. So I did. I went back and played it. And I stood on that theater stage just absolutely on the first night, dreading it, absolutely sort of thinking, what's going to happen? And luckily, I got through it. And actually, what happened? was some people came from Doctor Who Ooh. to watch the show because they were looking for Winston Churchill, Churchill. to be in oh. Doctor Who. And that's how I got the role. So thank goodness I went back and did theatre at that point. 
because it led me to that, which is great. So, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Very fortunate. And then I did, I loved the theater so much that I then did another few plays afterwards. I worked at the, um, I worked at the Globe, which is that wonderful theater outside, um, which is the recreation of the Shakespeare uh, theater. I worked there and then I did the King's Speech in the West End playing again, Winston Churchill. So Winston has been me for a few times now, God yeah. bless you. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, my my pre my preference would be mm -hmm. theatre mm -hmm. with film money. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the head, there, right. there we go. Real specific. You can do uh, no better than that. Go. I have to say, I'm very impressed. Yes, and I'm 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 starting doing a new one man show, mm -hmm. and it's having its um, it's having its premiere in a theatre in Wrexham. Um, oh goodness me. Yes. That's that mm. place where there's a lot of Americans in Wrexham, aren't there? Oh. They've got a football they team. are indeed. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping one or two might come along. So oh, it's uh, uh, I was asked to do an evening with. So I've, it, it, it's a sort of one of my one man shows broadened out. And it's uh, and the tagline is my 60 years living with Doctor Who. Oh. So that's all I will say. And Which day is that, Simon? Sorry? Which day do you go? Uh, oh, to it's that? called the Thai Porb, T Y, and then Porb, B A P A W B. It's in Market Street, Wrexham, hmm. and it's on the first of September. Hmm. So the first, it, it's it's the first outing of it, really. So well done, uh, and that's that's going to be you on stage, me on stage, uh, uh, and uh, I've got um, a PowerPoint presentation. Plus, there'll be somebody interviewing me. Uh, oh, but I'll be, act, I'll be acting out a few things, plus talking about uh, my connections with Doctor Who and also what Doctor Who has meant to me through my life, because I'm 62 in November. Uh, and I so I was uh, I was two on the 25th of November when Doctor Who first broadcast mm -hmm. on the 23rd, of course. Oh, good. So, That's great. Yeah. Mm, That's wonderful yeah. that you're doing that. That's wonderful. Well done. So it's getting me back on the boards because yeah. people think now I'm in a wheelchair that I've lost my brain. Uh, so uh, there we go. Just run those people over. <laughs> yeah. Run yeah. over. Yeah. Just run them over. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's uh, coming up to 10 past seven, this end of the woods. Mm -hmm. I need to move on. So I apologize to pull out short. Uh, right. But Ian, thank, thank you so much for coming on. Again, and it's lovely seeing everybody else again. Yep. And As I look always. forward to catching up with you all again soon. Thank you, Simon. Right. Thank, Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Thank you so much, Simon. Bye bye, Simon. Bye for bye. now. Oh, wait a minute, Simon. Some, somebody wants to say goodbye. <laughs> oh. Right outside your window. Oh, so <laughs> and he's disconnected. And he's <laughs> So, Ian, I, I have a question for you. I'm, I'm sure people have asked this before you. If you've never been bitten by the acting bug, what do you think you'd be doing today? Say again? If you weren't uh, bitten by the acting bug, what would you be doing today? Oh, I've got no idea. I suppose it would be another sort of entertainment area. I suppose I'd be sort of running a restaurant or a hotel or something like that. Okay. Entertainment of some sort. It would have to be that, I think, you know, meeting people and greeting them and bringing them in. So I suppose it would be something along those lines. Yeah, I would have thought. Yeah. So more of the hospitality mm -hmm. industry. Actually. Hospitality industry, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. which is the same thing. It's an extension of being an actor, I think, yeah. Taking care of people. Taking care and just, you know, fronting the whole thing and sort of being larger than life. Has playing Churchill so much given you the, the political bug? On a decent <laughs> not, not quite so much. <laughs> I have to say, look, there he is, my goodness me. What a lovely couple they were. I have to say, it was only the sort of second um, uh, outing for Matt, who was playing the doctor at that point, and he was still very nervous and still very youthful and still very trying all sorts of ways and just had so much energy and so much invention and was an absolute delight to work with, as she was. And she's gorgeous, I have to say. It was very funny because he came in one day and said, actually, They'd been watching TV. He'd been watching the TV the other night before, and he rang up. He said, "Listen, listen, it's him. It's McNeese. He's on TV. He's an Ace Ventura when Nature Calls." 
So I turned up the next day and they said that they go to watch the show together, which was very sweet, which I liked that. Very nice. Great people. What what did bring you into acting? Uh, what, what was the thing that just brought you in and just said, this you know, is because I couldn't do anything else, but it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I completely failed at my... We've just had A-levels in England, which are sort of our SATs, and people have just had their results. And I remember my results were complete fails at A-levels. So I was thinking to myself, my father was distraught, saying, what is it going to be? And so my father had sent me off to a vocational guidance organization, which is where you tick the boxes and it tells you what they think you should be. So I ticked all the boxes. At the end of it, they said, I should either be a journalist or an estate agent, a realtor. So mm -hmm. my dad said, oh, be a realtor because you can play golf on Thursday afternoons. Where he got that from, I got no idea. Maybe he had some friends or relations that played golf who were realtors themselves. But that's too, but so, so thank goodness I didn't get down that road. But uh, no, it was, it was you know, I mean, I, I, I was fortunate in the fact that at school, mm -hmm. it was a school that really had a good drama department. So mm -hmm. I spent all my time doing plays and, and drama as opposed to learning my exams. So that's why I failed all that, but, you know, luckily succeeded in another area. Which is interesting you mentioned that thing where they had you tick mark the boxes for your occupation yes. when you were a kid, yeah. because I actually took that, and one of the things I was granted was firemen. And I told the teacher, there's no way in heck I'm going to be a fireman. and. They go, well, I would not be. That? My goodness me. I, I just was like, I, I think it was like public service, like police or something of that nature, but it was more or less like firemen or something to that. I just remember the teacher going, why wouldn't you be a fireman? I said, I'm usually the one that starts the fire. <laughs> <laughs> why would I put That's out what I just go. started out there? So it's just That's like. That's definitely the way to go. <laughs> I got you there. Um, I got, uh, gotcha. I got. Oh, uh, Gadget says she got detected. <laughs> okay. okay. And that's why she's a journalist. That's why she uh, does something. <laughs> she's going to be out there, there. Whatever they give you, you want to be the opposite. Exactly. Uh, the rebellious kid or a normal kid. Yes. You want to be what they tell you to do. I think, um, Melanie, did you say you got to go? Yeah, I have, I, if you want to wrap the, to the hour part and then go to the after party, then I'll. Sure. Uh, did you have a final question? Uh, no, I, I unfortunately don't. You got no, no worries. I have to go. All right, folks, we're going to go into the after party. Ian, you stay as long as you want to. Mm -hmm. Melanie, thanks. Nick, stick around out there. Uh, for those of you who are watching uh, the show and or listening to it, again, uh, Facebook.com, The Legend of the Traveling Target, 71,000 Nubian followers and still growing to this moment out there. And if you haven't already right now, please subscribe. YouTube.com slash The Legend of the Traveling Target, 3,200 YouTube subscribers and constantly growing. If you want to hear all the audios, iHeartRadio, Sci-Fi.Radio, Odyssey, Spotify, Spreaker. Yeah, we're on the same network as Joe Rogan. We are here. Uh, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, you can listen to us then. We're going to go into the after party. So the folks who have been listening, thank you so much for joining us. For those of you still watching, uh, please uh, continue to join us. We will continue as long as Ian wants to stay. We'll be right back after this little glitch. And thank you so much. Gotcha. There we go. <laughs> See, magic oh. get rid of Melanie. <laughs> oh. that's, that's great. It's a neat great have over here, Ian. Um, Nick, what uh, what kind of questions did you have for Ian? Uh, wait, wait a minute. I got a question. Ian, yeah, you ask me a question. I, yeah. I know you. I know you're big on acting, but I mean, what do you do? I, I, it's a strange question, but I'm going to ask you, sir, What do you do at, for fun? What do you do after? Everything is said. Right. You know what the thing is? This is that I mean, I, I mean, well, um, yeah, goodness, well, it's all related to the same thing, isn't it? You know, I'm a big Netflix watcher. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I love watching all these shows on Netflix or Prime Time or stuff like that, or looking at Showtime and stuff like that. And HBO. I'm, I love catching up with all those shows. So, so that that's my favorite hobby. That really is. I mean, I enjoy that. And, so, uh, yes. so, so what shows are you following? Well, at the moment, I suppose I've been watching, um, I, I, I'm just trying to think that uh, um, uh, Sandman, which I had a little oh, tiny part in. Neil yeah. Gaiman, okay. A little tiny part in Sandman, yeah. so I've been watching that lately. Foundation, I had another little tiny part in that, so I'm watching the second series of Foundation on Apple TV, which is great. And um, 
Uh, and so I'm just trying to think what what else I've been lately watching. Oh, The Silo, which I think is a terrific show. That's on Apple too, I think. So yeah, no, no, uh, there's a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff, I have to say. And speaking of which, you mentioned HBO, and this is where I've caught you as well. On oh, Rome. that's right. Yes, I had to do. A, I had to do a cameo only yesterday. They actually asked me to do a cameo as that character. Oh, really? I love that character so much. So I had to dress up. I've got a little. Oh my God. Of, got a little outfit in the back there that I put on, which I can. I got some robes that I can put on as well, you know, and just so I had to do all the gestures from it. And it was for an anniversary or something. I say so. Uh, you yeah. know, the newsreader. What? You were the newsreader. Yes. I was the newsreader, and then I had to do this. It was anniversary for these two people that loved the show, so I had to mention their names as the newsreader, you know. So I had to do a lot of, you know, Gaius Julius Caesar and Grenade O'Connor Fortuna or something like that, you know. You, know. you should just tell people you're in your pajamas when you're doing that. <laughs> or it does look like a sort of nighty of some sort, I have to mm -hmm. say, yeah. Just go over and head back to bed when you're done reading all the yeah, exactly, materials out there. Exactly. So, uh, so uh, Simon mentioned that he had to unfortunately cancel a, a cameo. What's the strangest thing that somebody has asked you to do on their on your cameo? Or, I had to marry someone. Really? I had to propose to someone as the person, right? And he was there, and, and I said, "Look, just you know, video what you're doing as well, so I can see it." So I actually had to say, "Look, um, you know, uh, uh, Roger or whatever his name was." wants to marry you, will you marry Roger? And he was there on the day. She was mm -hmm. watching the screen and there I was saying, mm -hmm. will you marry Roger? And he had a he had a ring. <laughs> Thank God she said yes. I have to say yes. <laughs> it would have been really awkward if we turned around and you know, you know. So that was my yes, that sure. was my fait accompli. And I said, send me the video afterwards because I have to see her saying yes, which he did, which was good, you know, which is great, you know. So you, you, you gave said. the proposal, not him, but you I gave, gave him the proposal. Ah. I, said, you know, I said, Vivian, will you marry Roger or something like that? Oh, no. uh, you know, something like that. It's creative. Because I'm worried yes. that Vivian was answering. And he gave her the yes. ring, and then that, that was it. Yeah. So I wonder if they're still together. <laughs> I hope so. Well, yeah, concerned that Vivian was saying yes to you, not to Roger. <laughs> <laughs> you know who I was expecting. <laughs> exactly, dude, that's nothing I've been expecting out there. No. I, I think um, back when COVID, began, another you... one was uh, you know, oh. I've I've done a couple of them as as uh, uh, this is quite strange too because I did this um, I did this TV show called Conspiracy, mm -hmm. which is about the Bonze Conference, which is about the Final Solution, which is about all these people sitting around a table discussing what to do with the Jews and the war. It actually happened. There was this conference that took place called the Wannsee Conference in Berlin. Heydrich was there, Eichmann was there, and they discussed with 14 people sitting around a table. And we shot this, Branner uh, uh, played Heydrich, and um, Stanley Tucci played Eichmann. Uh, Colin Firth was in it. I was in it, and uh, David Throbel, lots of very good people in it. And uh, it was a great show. It was for... Um, uh, it was for HBO too, and um, one of after, which is good because it was a really, really good show. But I get cameos saying, Can you "Please do your character from Conspiracy, Klopfer, mm. Gerhard Klopfer." So that's like, you know. So what am I going to do? Happy birthday to you from Klopfer. You know, it's like <laughs> done. Go figure. Go figure, you know. You know? They're going to see you having a birthday message. Happy birthday. What are we going to do with all these people? <laughs> no, exactly, exactly, <laughs> That's probably yeah. not the way you wanted your birthday. No, no, no. So there's been some, there's been some uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting characters, I have to say. Very, um, very interesting people, you know. In fact, that one that I was talking about, <coughs> mm -hmm. we know that <coughs> the one in Montana, The Black Angus uh, uh, farmer. I said, "Look, um, mm -hmm. can you video his reaction? Because I just love the idea of this uh, this Black Angus farmer coming in off the ranch. You know, he's spending a hot day with all the all, all the cattle. 
coming into the city down and watching a little episode of Doc Martin set in this village in the middle of nowhere. So they did it. They, they, they filmed him <coughs> looking bemused at the screen. And I, I, I don't think he quite got it that I was actually talking to him, Gene, Gene, Gene. And then he got it. And he said, he's talking to me. And so, yeah. That's <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, you're fine. It's okay. I should be drinking water. I've been drinking peach. Uh, I don't. I don't know if you, Nick. You, do you have Cracker Barrel where you're at, Nick? Oh, of course. Okay. What's that? There, there's this. It, it's a country restaurant slash store. It's it's famous for being off of uh, interstate exits called Cracker Barrel. And Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel. It's a southern cuisine. That, you know, scrambled eggs, uh, uh, steak. You know, more of American eclectic out there. Mm -hmm. And is it a uh, restaurant? It is a restaurant, and yeah. it also has a store attached to it. So you and the store attached it, to it. It's called Cracker Barrel. It's called Cracker mm -hmm. Barrel, and the store is famous for having holiday stuff way earlier than it should. Right. So they were having Halloween stuff right in July. So I was just like, but people will buy this stuff. But the the funny part about it is, you were drinking your water, and I have in here, um, like it. It's that eight. Uh, it comes in an eight pack bottle, but it's these different eclectic drinks like root beer and grape and uh, peach knee high and stuff like that. Mm, so yum. that's what I'm drinking right here is peach knee high. I, I was, <laughs> uh, somehow or another, Chrissy brought it home. My wife brought it home, and I was like, okay, I gotta try this stuff. So I'm drinking peach knee high, and you were drinking water. I'm like, I need to be drinking water. That's what I should be doing. Peach yeah. knee high. Yes. Peach knee high. I love the name Peach Knee High. That's peach great. Knee High. There's some, they're like eight different bottles. They're not even the same brand. It's not like Coca Cola or Pepsi. They're totally different in their own right. That's way right. cool. Um, we got a question in the audience. Um, hi there, Jay. Don't forget to subscribe and uh, check out uh, Ian's cameo. What do you think about tools like Chat GPS being utilized in fiction and nonfiction writings? There you go. Cool? I think that's for, uh, I guess it's oh, for all I'm of us, you. but. I, I mean, oh, who's that in the background coming in? <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Is that the missus? Yeah, you can turn your audio shopping. on. Is she been this shopping? is Professor Ross yeah. Smith. She just wanted to say hello to Ian and Chris. Hello. Christine. Hi. Hello. Did you, Did you bring us anything? Some yeah, peach knee high by any chance? Do you have peach knee high lemonade, anything like I've that? I've got ordinary lemonade, I've got diet coke, I've got lots of beer. Oh, oh nice. okay. Nice. <laughs> Love that. See you later. See you. Bring in the cushions. Bring in the <laughs> What did you do with this? Yes, I have no idea what this person is talking about. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 think, he, I think he's just bringing it to the. There's something called. I think it's going to be taken from someone else. Who it, it, that? Did it, you do it? It's uh, oh. well, go ahead, go ahead, Nick. You go first. So, we are having a party at the house that I'm staying at. We've got a whole bunch of guests coming, and so Roz has made lemonade for them. Okay, and she has cushions. So, <laughs> what do you think about the tools like Chat GPT being utilized in fiction mm -hmm. and non fiction writing? Can you answer that? I I've seen it. I, I think they're talking more. about artificial intelligence, right? This is where I, I've heard mm -hmm. about the Jet GPT that now it can write stories and stuff. You could actually tell it, "Hi, I want uh, a script where Ian McNeese plays Winston Churchill, but it's not related to Doctor Who, and I want it to be an hour long." And it would actually write out the entire script. And if I'm wrong about that, Jr., let me know. Is that I for think the computer that does that. Yes. This is where I think this is where we're coming into that strike phase that's taking place now in the states. Oh, uh, with the right. writers and good, right. right? Because mm -hmm. now writers are being artificial replaced by artificial intelligence. Oh, right! Wow. And okay. it seems to be a strange line because now, what is it? A uh, deep fake? Did I get that term right? Deep fake yeah. is now in play and all that, whereas yeah. actors and and writers are being replaced by computer now. I'm gonna have to look up Chat GPT. I think that's okay. It's 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 uh, essentially an AI program. The scripts I've seen, they're technically okay, but they lack that human factor. You know, they lack that yeah. emotional intelligence that hopefully okay. we can bring to a script. Right. I have to look that up. 
Well, it's being written by it's being written by a, a, a computer and computers only have as much as we want to give them mm -hmm. with that. And you, you, there's something to be said about the human experience and the human way that we come across that there's that great line. I can't believe I'm going to be saying this. There's a great line in um, war games with Matthew Broderick. Yeah. If you remember that and the prof I professor, professor Hawking's, yeah, Professor Hawkins walks up to the general and he says, do you really believe that the Russians are going to launch all these missiles so that the only choice we have is to annihilate them? And then he says the line, General, you're listening to a machine. Do the world the favor and don't act like one. Mm -hmm. And I think right, that right. is, a, I think that's a beautiful line to say in response to the world of AI that we're slowly coming into now. And now that we're treading lightly on not how, you know, not just the entertainment industry, but life itself, um, where we can ask something to do all. And then, hello, Tanil, how you doing? Thank you for joining us out there. Ian <laughs> McNeese. Nice? That, that's my opinion on that. But the computer will never replace the human element and the human experience. There's just no replacement in that. Right, whether it's writing or acting, even in the mm -hmm. background, you know, you have seen a couple of films where they have CGI background actors, and you can tell they're just kind of looping the motions. They're not real. Right. I guess, are you familiar with what's going on in the States when they're talking about artificial intelligence? Or it's like, oh, really? nah. no, no. It's like, no, no, not my monkeys, not my circus. I'm not going to deal with that. It is kind of a scary preposition, but I mean, it's just it's it's something that is being looked into, and I think now that corporations are looking into it, it's you know. But I, I will attest to that. It's just like the, you know, do the world a favor and don't be like one. Don't be a machine. The machine can only go so far, but doesn't have that know-how that the human brain has. And the human brain is not perfect, and it has those flaws and everything. But that can't be interpreted into a machine that has to do something perfect you have to have those flaws coming from human or else it, it just doesn't seem to work but i've never seen a, a an ai script acted out so i mean if, if let, let's put it this way if you knew uh, ian that the, there was a script written by a computer would you do it i uh, i suppose if the part was good yeah <laughs> okay mm -hmm. fair enough uh, it's just you've been uh, <laughs> But yeah. if it meant that a writer was not going to get paid for it, then I'd have to say no, obviously, because mm. you've got to stay with the writers. So you can't. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, if that's what the whole thing is about, then, mm -hmm. uh, then we have to stay with um, the people that need it more. So, yes, I have to say no to that. I'd rather have something that thought of, you know, that wrote a script with brain synopsis than, exactly. than, yeah. than an algorithm, if that makes sense. And I'm not yeah. dissing that what that. I'm not dissing what may come by, but just funny when you mentioned earlier that you would be in the hospitality. I was in. I was working for theme parks for about eight years. Oh, you were. Which ones? Uh, I was for a very long time Walt Disney World. Uh, I got to see the opening of Disney. Was that Florida? Yes. Yeah. The bigger one. The bigger one. <laughs> Disney the of what? Yeah, Disneyland is the first and is in California, but. Walt, when he built Disneyland, he never um, he never thought ahead. When he built Disneyland, everybody bought the properties around him, mm. so he could never expand. So he was kind of locked in when it came to his location in Anaheim, California. When he bought Disney World, and you can actually see a video on YouTube of Walt, he said he bought an entire land. I mean, he bought practically an entire city from the governor of Florida and just said, this is going to be Walt Disney World and it's going to have enough land to express all the creativity and imagination that Disney Imagineers could test. So there's like four theme parks here, two water parks, uh, a downtown facility, uh, two, three golf courses. I just, it is an entire city. In fact, people make the common mistake when you hear the word Orlando, everybody thinks that's Walt Disney World and it's not. Mm -hmm. Well, Disney World's actually in another city called Lake Buena Vista. It's its own city. And uh, that's... For so what was your job? I was an uh, attraction host. I was uh, 
Jungle Cruise, Haunted Mansion, Hall of Presence, Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, then I was sent to open up Animal Kingdom over where, and I still to this day call it Countdown to Extinction, not Dinosaur. That's just my preference. Um, you don't take a Snickers wrapper, remove it, and then put a whatchamacallit on it. It'll still be a Snickers. That's what I said. And by the time I was said and done, I think I had worked over 30 merchandise shops and over 30 attractions in some form wow. or fashion. 30 merchandise shops? Yes. Oh, my God. All over the park. All over the parks, all over the hotels, somewhere. Working in merchandise shops. Yeah, it's it's pretty easy. All you have to... Saying all the toys and stuff, right? Yep. Wow, wow. That was the easier gig because when you worked at the merchandise shop, if you could work in one shop, you can work them all because they had the same registers and stuff. You were just selling different uh, apparel. Mm -hmm. So, I, right. I mean, I could end up at uh, Space Mountain. I could end up at... Uh, star tours over at the uh the studios because it, it, it didn't matter you just kind of it was just the way the merchandise was presented and how did they you, did things did you get free rides all the time for when i was there you could um before they did the reservation during covid mm -hmm. i could go into the park anytime i wanted to as long wow. as they weren't at capacity wow mm. and you did strange. yeah it was fun it was one of my favorite things, I don't know if you, you do this a ton, from time to time, Ian. Have you ever called what I call a people watcher? You'll just oh, sit I in a chair. Yeah. yeah. It's fun. It's uh, I would just get off work, and you, what I would do is what I call decompress. I would just change out of my clothes, go into the park, sit down, and I would just people watch. Just watch other people having fun or seeing how cool. people reacted to something. Yeah. And uh, that was my decompression. But sometimes it also caused stress because you had the kids yelling <laughs> as well. <laughs> so it kind of contradicted itself. But it was fun. And I would just go on a ride or two just to decompress and then leave for the day. What was your favorite ride? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's like saying, what's your favorite project you've ever done? It would be. It, it, yeah. Okay. I'll tell you what. I'll give you my favorite ride if you tell me what's your favorite project I'll, I'll, you know i'll even put it this way what's when it comes when things are said and done on your imdb when you've finally said you know i'm gonna hang this up what i guess for a better term product i'll just put it that way i have no idea like between the movies between the tv show between the theater which project thank you thank you nick would you be most proud of to say this is if anybody wants to think of Ian McNeese, this is what I want them to remember me by? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's crazy, isn't it? Because I mean, there are so many things that I suppose because it's been the longest run, it'll have to be Doc Martin, I think. I mean, because mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the character that I, I'm sure I will be identified with most with the amount of people that have seen it, really. I mean, I think that. And your favorite ride? <sighs> <laughs> I was hoping I'd have an answer by the time you answered your question. Well, um, Countdown to Extinction is a really good ride. I, I it was it was called before? it was called it's in I was Extinction. Yeah, well, the fourth theme park that <laughs> opened up is called Disney's Animal Kingdom, and there was this there's this ride. It's now called Dinosaur, but it was before it was called that. It was called Countdown to Extinction. For a while, Disney had this idea of changing the names of rides to improve them. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. When it came to Countdown to Extinction, the only reason why they changed the name of the ride was because they were having a movie coming out called Dinosaur. So they were trying to match this ride to this event, but the two net didn't have anything to do with each other, except they had dinosaurs in them. So I opened the theme park, and I got to be the person to open my favorite ride, which was Countdown to Extinction. And uh, I thought it was uh, a... a brilliant ride you were supposed to be on a time traveling uh go figure uh, uh jeep to go back and rescue a dinosaur before the end of extinction mm -hmm. and you just happen to go back at the time when the the asteroid is coming down and destroying the earth at that moment 65 million years to go to grab one particular dinosaur and bring him back and that's the storyline to it oh wow yes so that happened no, no, no. <laughs> that was just the story of the ride. <laughs> that was the story of the ride. That was the story yeah. of the ride. The, the ride and the movie had nothing to do with each other, except they had the same dinosaurs being used. That was right. it. Mm. The ride was something about time travel, and the movie was about the dinosaurs. So they had almost right. nothing in common. But because it was my it was my first attraction that I opened from scratch, 
and it was for the first theme park that I ever opened from scratch. It was kind of like my first love. Right. My first love would be the ride was great. The ride was tremendous. I always recommended it to everybody. I think it was one considered the best ride at Walt Disney World at one point. And and, and the ride was a jeep. Was a jeep where you inside a jeep? It. If this is the jeep, and everybody got in here, right? And the jeep, they called it a motion-based simulator. The jeep moved, and it actually had oh, I see hydraulics mean, under it to, you know. Yes. It was a simulator. It was a simulator, but it actually moved. It was on a track. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So it, it was. It was. I thought it was one of the best rides out there, and it, for me, it was. And I was being jealous. But my first love was Jungle Cruise because that was my first mm -hmm. attraction. Jungle Cruise. Yes. Great. We're talking the, about you, oh, not me. <laughs> a good interviewer. Ian. Was that a proper boat? Do I have to tell the truth? <laughs> yes, tell us, tell us. You can probably see it on the internet. Here we go again with it. You know what? I actually, I actually have a jungle boat, but it's in another room. Um, the jungle boat was, as far as the schematics, it was real. It was a real boat. Mm -hmm. It could not be nautically possible to steer that boat in the channel that it was in. It would constantly go off to the side. So, and they show pictures of this. Underneath the boat are two poles that come down like this. Oh. And there's a track underneath. The track has an opening that's wide enough for the poles to go across. And underneath the track are these two wheels that spin and guide the boat around it. The only thing that the uh, the Jungle Cruise skipper has ability to do is stop the boat or, move, or go backwards, go forward and that. They only have control of going forward and backward. The track made it spin and move around a bit. Wow! Because it was Florida, and if you they they even said that if you were if these were free floating vessels, it, you would be constantly wrecking because the Florida winds every so often when the hurt when the when the storms came in would blow the boats off sure. course and they're so tight. So you know, I had to be on a, yes, yes, of course, mm -hmm. I had to be like that. Ian, you're the best interviewer of this show right now. <laughs> Nobody wants to know about me. <laughs> yeah, if you want to come back and interview somebody, go for it. <laughs> I did want to ask, Ian, you talked about some of your favorite shows right now. Um, do you watch your yourself? Some actors hate watching themselves. Oh, my God, I can't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, my God. No, no, I'm, I'm there. 100%. No. Really? Yeah, I love it. I enjoy watching the shows. I enjoy them. I just mm -hmm. enjoy the shows I've been doing. And sometimes I go, oh, good, I'm glad I did that, or I could have been better there, or why didn't I do that, or something. Yeah, so well, there's always questioning stuff that you've done, which is, which right. is good. And you learn from it, and you learn what not to do and what's good, and what yeah. works, what doesn't. So, yeah. Yeah. And some of the older shows that we've talked about, they're they're being revived, they're being revisited, you know, with Brit Box and Blu-ray and absolutely, absolutely. They're all out there now. I know mm -hmm. it's great. It's yeah. great. It's, it's phenomenal. Fun. You know. No, it's, you know, it's like dying. You see your life appearing in front of you with all these things. Just very slowly. <laughs> you know, I used to have I mean I you used to have that feeling at um in conventions with someone who would come up and they'd have a they'd have a sort of photograph of you from way back when from some obscure thing that you've done before and you look at it and you go oh my god it, it is it's like it's like you know my life is dying in front of me it's like you know i can see yourself you know it's like they say that don't they that, that when you're drowning you can see your life you know mm -hmm. it was like same thing at conventions so you, um, how often do you come to the conventions in the states now not because of COVID, they've all cut back now. Cut back, yeah. so, you know, and so um, I haven't done a convention in the states for quite a while now. So yeah, no. But I, I used to come all the time. I used mm -hmm. to do two, two, uh, you know, three or four times a year. I go in and do stuff. But it, it's all, it's all, it's all cut back now because of COVID. In your eyes, is there a big difference between an American and a UK audience, or a 
an audience from another um, from another country? Not really. I, I mean, I think they're all the same. I, I mean, I, I mean, certainly the conventions in America are a lot, a lot bigger and more people are there. Mm -hmm. We have much smaller conventions in, in, in the UK, apart from the ones that the really big ones that that happen in London. But there are loads of them all over the country, which are the smaller ones. You know, it's great. But I used to love it. I used to enjoy it a lot. And do you have a favorite convention or a favorite moment that you've had when you went out to convention? Well, Gallifrey I used to go to quite a lot. And that was the one in Los Angeles. Yeah, Gallifrey one. I used to go to that one quite a few times in the early days. And, you, you know, it would be a lot of fun with the after show games and stuff like that. And I would do the, you know, do, do, do those games. They'd ask you to do games. And, and then used to judge some of the costumes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of sort of after show stuff you do, which I enjoyed doing, you know. What part are you having, Nick? <laughs> I'm just curious about that. I just got into it. It's, it's the, I got to talk to Ian McNeese party. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> I think it's the start of the school year at the State University of New York here. Oh, okay. So, um, we got to celebrate. Getting I'll send all these Ian coming in. You have to send Ian a beer, and I'll send him a, 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 a peach knee high on the way out. <laughs> peach knee high. I, I like that. Is a there some? Is there something in the states that you uh, miss when you come over? When you come well, over? I actually come over quite a lot because my partner is an American. We met on Ace Ventura. She was a production coordinator. Oh. We've been with each other ever since, like twenty-seven years now. And she's American, and her father, who's 91 and completely uh, extraordinary individual, plays golf three times a week and is going to outlive us all. He's, he's a phenomenal character called Roger. And he lives in Kansas, um, mm -hmm. Hutchinson, Kansas. And so quite a few times uh, over the years, we've got – I spent Christmas there last Christmas uh, so, so we could spend it with him. And my partner, Cindy, has just gone back now. She's actually in Kansas at the moment. So yes, so so I travel there a lot, and uh, Wichita, um, which is just down the road from Hutchinson, uh, the the uh, the uh, PBS station has asked me to go and do several links there. I, I, I go and do the, you know, hello, this is your PBS show. Please, can you contribute to? You know, I do all that. Hello, right. here, and all those little chats that you do to camera. So I would, whenever I. They get in touch with Roger saying, when is Ian coming over? Can he come come over to Wichita? And so he'd drive me over there and we'd do some of these and, you know, they'd give us some barbecue to say thank you and that would be it, you know, which is great. Well, production so, coordinator is... is and know. also my son, my son, uh, who went to UCSB, met an American girlfriend and married her, mm -hmm. and he now lives in, in uh, San Francisco. And it's become an American. He's now got a dual nationality. So I see oh, him yeah. in San Francisco. I go and visit him with my two grandchildren. I've got two wow. grandchildren. I've got a little, um, little, little Ada May, who's now three, and Otis, Otis Wilder, who's now about six months. So wow. they all live in San Francisco. Yeah, so I visited there quite a few times. What I a great place that is. I think through COVID, you were. Ha I think you either had or were having a grandchild. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I did. That, yes, I do remember. And yes, and uh, yeah, yeah. That, that was Ada May, and she, she, we couldn't see her for like six months because, and, and then they finally came over and brought her. Yes, absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, okay. How and how's she doing? She's doing really great. She's. Um, uh, we just spent. Uh, we, we were lucky because they have this thing in America. And I have to say, I take my hat off to them. With maternity leave, and they give both maternity leave to both men and women which is great. Mm -hmm. So my son and daughter have just, uh, daughter-in-law, have just had six months um, uh, maternity leave. So we, we all decided to have a holiday together. Oh. We went to the Dominican Republic for about a month, which was great. Rented right a little villa there, just by the beach and that. So I spent really quality time with them all. I got to know my, my grandson for the first time. I hadn't met him. And my granddaughter, who learned to swim in the pool. So that was really great. So we had a wonderful time. Gotcha. Now you are in coming up into this movie, and uh, Ridley Scott—it's uh, Napoleon. Oh, look at that! 
Isn't that a good picture? That's Tell us great. About, this is coming out in November. Tell us a little bit about. Yeah, uh, it's coming Napoleon. out in November. It, 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 I mean, I think it's been his. Um, uh, it's been his absolute. Um, uh, one of the things that he's wanted to make for years, which is this movie about the life of Napoleon. And of course, there he is. Joachim Phoenix is, uh, is, is Napoleon. And they got on so well on Gladiator 1, uh, mm -hmm. in which they work with on that. And, um, and I'm just trying to remember, I'm just trying to work it out. Because there's a wonderful um, uh, actress who plays the part of um, Josephine. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to remember who, who that is. Okay, I'm looking, see if uh, I can pick it up here. Yeah. On IMDb. <laughs> oh, we're doing all both doing the same thing. Can you do the same thing? Well, I'm, that's what I'm looking up right now. I'm looking up the uh, and my computer's are just a wee bit slower than because <laughs> I got the show running as well. You know, they haven't released a lot of details about Napoleon yet. They're keeping it under his hat. Vanessa Kirby. That's who it is. Okay. Vanessa Kirby, who was who was Margaret. Um, in in uh, in um, it was a fantastic Margaret in the Crown. Mm. Oh, okay. She was um, the, the Queen's sister. She was wonderful as Margaret uh, in the Crown, and she also did a um, she also did a wonderful. I'm just trying to think. Vanessa Kirby. She did a. Uh, she's also appeared in a great movie too. Oh, let me which, see. Um, uh, let me see if I can find that too. I'm looking her up. Um, according to this, Mission Impossible Six. That's right. She was in that. She's very good in that too. But the other uh, movie is Pieces of Pieces of a Woman, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. Look at these photographs. My God, you have some great photographs in these. Look well, at that. It's fantastic. Well, they're 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 actually having a sequel coming out next year. Uh, it's called Napoleon Two, and it, it, it's something that looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and there he is, Napoleon Two. That's Napoleon Two, <laughs> and I, I think Margot Robbie or somebody's <laughs> with there. But uh, uh, here is, give it a second. Here is Vanessa. Oh, oh yeah, she's gorgeous, isn't she gorgeous? Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah, there's I, a very, very funny thing that happened. So um, yeah, the first day I turn up, uh, I'm playing Louis. Louis the Eighteenth, and I've got all this fantastic because uh, I'm a king. I've got this wonderful costume that looked looked like a million dollars, and uh, so and we're filming at Blenheim Palace, which is the most wonderful, spectacular palace. In which actually another link here, which the judge was born there, at Blenheim Palace, which is interesting. So anyway, this fantastic palace called Blenheim Palace, and I, I'm, I'm sitting sitting around waiting to start work, and suddenly through the door comes. Ridley Scott and I stand up and I go over to him and I introduced him and I go and we had a little chat and then he says, uh, would you like a coffee? <laughs> Ridley Scott asking me if I want a coffee and I say, no, 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 please, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. And he said, oh, okay. So he goes off and this assistant comes up to me and says, would you like anything? I said, yeah, well, I'd really, I'd really like a coffee. And he goes, well, you can't have one. I said, wow. <laughs> I have one in Blenheim Palace, but not allowed to drink coffee in there. I said, I just got off with a coffee by Ridley Scott. He said, Oh, well, he's different. He's got he's got his own cappuccino maker in a tent just, just over there. I said, I should have said yes. <laughs> said yes oh, no. Ridley, give me a coffee. You know, because you know, I didn't get one, did I? You know. But he was such a joy, I have to say. Mm. I mean, just um, I didn't realize because you know these things are huge. If you look at the the amount of crew, right, the amount of crew, you can look at the call sheets that you get when you start work. On the call sheets, it's got, you know, what time you have breakfast, what time you have lunch, what time you have this and that. But it gives you the crew members. So um, on Doc Martin, it would say uh, uh, 65 crew members for lunch. Wow. On Napoleon, mm -hmm. 453 crew members for lunch. Blimey. Can you just think of that? Can you just think of all those people involved in a Ridley Scott movie? I mean, they are just vast. They are huge. I just walked out of a door of Burnham Palace and there were these huge cranes with these gigantic lights on them. Just 
burning inside so they could have a, a good lighting set up on that. But it was, it was, uh, it was extraordinary. And I have to, uh, as Louis the, uh, Louis the 18th, they, they gave me this Pekingese, which I had to hold the whole time, this little dog and feed various things as they, throughout the city. Yeah. And Ridley really Scott's a going. It's a lot of fun. Ridley Scott's I going, I need a bigger tent. I just, hope, I just hope it's made the cut. So let's hope that yeah. Louis the 18th is in the movie. That's all I have. He should be. He's the king. He's the king, love. He's the king. Yeah. So, but there's photographs of, uh, I have to say, Joachim Phoenix looks wonderful. Mm. So. He does look really good. He think. does. He does look absolutely fantastic. So that's coming. That'll open in uh, America on Thanksgiving. Right. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. so hopefully in the November so we'll for look, look Thanksgiving. Look forward to that just in time for Oscar because I think it just just makes the Oscar uh, link just before Christmas, I think. That's, mm -hmm. the, uh, that's the cutoff for Oscars for the next year, I think. Uh, we have Kevo Reese in the chats. He says, I loved Ian's appearance in The Sandman. Recently discovered the 90s film of Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat and was thrilled when I saw him in it. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, what can you say? Because, I mean, that, to me, you don't get any better than actually working with Donny Osmond. Come on. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and I can remember, I, I can remember, I, I think uh, John Collins was my, uh, was my wife in that. So John Collins, who um, uh, we were meant to do a, a photo shoot, and I was getting changed and all made up for the photo shoot, and then appeared outside for the photo shoot, and I saw... Joan Collins walking down the stairs. I was meant to do the photo shoot with her. And she was in in her sort of uh, day clothes going home. And I said, Joan, what, what's happening? And she said, oh, I've got to go out to dinner. So she didn't do the photo shoot. I'm all dressed up. I'm all ready to do the photo shoot. But it didn't happen because she's going to dinner. So anyway, I get a phone call that night at home. And it's going, hey, buddy, it's Donnie here. I just want to say sorry about what happened with Joan. And I thought to myself, he called me Buddy. And I kept that, I kept that voice message for ages. <laughs> I mean, we called Buddy by Donny Osmond it was the best thing since sliced bread for me. I just love that. Mm -hmm. Donny Osmond, yeah, great. And uh Kevo uh continues. He says, Lessons learned, always say yes to Ridley Scott when he's offering you call. Yes. Always say yes to Ridley Scott. Need a bigger Scott. tent for him now. now on, from now on, I learned I learned my mistake. I learned my mistake. Oh, goodness me. Say yes to the director. Say yes but to the director. That's another. These people, I mean, it's like 80 something. I mean, it's still mm -hmm. making these vast, huge movies. I mean, they are just vast. I've seen the, I've seen the trailer for um, uh, Napoleon and some of the action sequences with the, the battles that he's fighting in these things are, are just immense and they look fantastic, I have to say. Just wonderful. Just wonderful. Is there a role that you want to do? If given the that. role that I want to do. Yeah, given that if there was more. Um, oh, goodness me. If, me. If, 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 I'm, I, I am Ridley Scott. And I'll bring you into my <laughs> coffee tent. Can we have coffee then? We have tons of coffee. And then I just sit yes, you down and you know, I said. I'm yes. thinking of doing an e a movie for you, Ian, and you know any role like I, you know Napoleon yeah. on the one with King Phoenix. To, you know, is there? A, yeah, yeah. The of Starbucks or something like that. <laughs> coffee, coffee, coffee. Yeah, yeah. I, I, is I, there? I, you know what? I mean, I, I'm I, I'm not greedy because I'm so thrilled with everything that I've got to play. You know, I mean, I've got to play Baron Harkonnen. You don't yes. do better than that, for God's sake. You know. Mm -hmm. And that was that was such a fantastic experience, and I always remember thinking to myself, I you know I got the role and I really pushed for the role and I, I did a wonderful tape, got sent to the director and I think that's how I, I got the role, and then I thought I kept kept writing to him and saying you know how how are you gonna fly me because I remember seeing the wonderful David Lynch movie which I thought was terrific hmm. with the Baron flying in that and I thought to myself how are you gonna fly me and he never got back to me. <laughs> and I turned up on the set uh, in, in Prague. We shot it in Prague. Uh, and they called me to rehearsals on the first day uh, uh, to, to uh, go, I'm going to learn how I'm going to fly. Because I knew the flying with the sort of, you know, cables, uh, and, uh, you're a heavy guy can be 
quite a painful experience, so I was right. hoping it wasn't going to be that. And there was a seesaw crane in the middle of the studio. And what they'd done, they had weights on one end. On the other hand, they had a, a bicycle seat. And they said, look, sit on that. And they put a sort of harness behind me. And then the seesaw crane went up, and I went up in the air, which is, and I thought, this is great. And they could move it around. And it was on a trolley, so we could move around the set and all the rest of it. And I was just, you know, sitting pretty on this thing. So I come in the next day, and I said, oh, what's happened to the bicycle seat? They've taken it away, right? And there was what is known as a racing bicycle seat. Now, a racing bicycle seat is, is tiny. It's like very, very, very yes. minuscule. Because they said the, the problem was is you look like you're sitting. So we have to have you standing. So I was, like, I was taking off on this thing, and it was so painful sitting on this thing with, you know, this, this bicycle seat that was now a, a racing bicycle seat. I said, take me down, take me down. I said, look, you've got to have something. Let's make some stirrups that you can put under my feet at the end, and then I can stand on the stirrups with this bicycle seat, which is what they did. And it was the most wonderful experience because for the next seven or eight weeks with this uh, same guy, Laszlo, was, was, was the guy, was the grip, moving me around on this, uh, uh, you know, on this dolly, which, which, which had me flying, as it were. And at the end of it, I, I brought... On the very final day I worked on it, I brought in a truck. I found out what Laszlo's favorite beer was. And I got him cases of, of his favorite beer. And I said, Laszlo, I could translate this for me. Laszlo, for the last eight, eight, eight weeks, you have been in my legs. Now here, this is for you. This is to say thank you. And I didn't see him for three days. I think he vanished with his beer and had a good time. I think good old Laszlo. If I'm not mistaken, the the racing bicycle seats are thinner because they're not sitting on them for most of the time. They're really that's standing exactly up. Right. That's just that's right. they just need to put their yeah. butts down for a few seconds. So yeah, that's it. And I had the privilege, if you want to call it, of actually being on a racing bicycle and said, "No, <laughs> <There is something. laughs> they put you on no. one." No, it feels like something you you never oh, yes. seen those torture things. That was it. The the, the yes. well, Exactly right. No, you're right. You're right. That's what it is. Mm. That's what it was. I could I couldn't get down fast enough. <laughs> it's like no, no, no. That's going up too far. No, that's not happening. That's yeah. not happening, baby. Yeah, I, I don't need a wild wild yeah. pelvis. That <laughs> there's no, nothing. It's not happening, baby. Not happening. <laughs> oh my God, Ian. I'm an, I, I'm glad you came back. I, I'm really thankful you came back here. One. It's like when you say when you're like, I'm going to be working with somebody. It's just like when people come on the show and I have an Ian McNeese and everybody comes out here. I'm really, really, he really, really goes. Mm, 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 mm. When Simon said, yeah, he'll, he'll come back. I'm like, you do have that kind of like imposter syndrome of like, who am I? Why am Ian McNeese is going to show up on my show for what? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I really, I, I'm, I really love it there. Uh oh. We got a latecomer and says, uh, "Sorry, I'm late." Uh, Ramona says hi, and, and uh, Kevo says that I love that story. Classic Joan and Donnie. Johnny and Don story, great. Yeah, mm. buddy. Hi, buddy. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just happy for anybody who wants to come on the show, and I really would try to make them as much as I can at home. And uh, if you were here, you would have bottles of peach knee high at your disposal right riding, ri riding right dinosaurs place. as much as you can where's home for you now uh in orlando are you still in orlando i'm still in orlando again well i i used to joke when i was a kid i don't need to travel because i have epcot and now <laughs> so now it's well i was like still, I, I, you still go to the theme parks always uh yeah. this year yeah one of the uh biggest um I don't, I don't want to say events or anything. I guess biggest projects that we do is uh, I take the traveling TARDIS to the theme parks during Halloween Horror Nights at Universal and at Disney when they do Mickey's Not So Scary and take a lot of pictures of it. And people love the holiday pictures of the traveling TARDIS, you know, with oh, Christmas wow, trees, that's great. With, with spooky zombies and monsters, and they, they just get a kick out of it. I bet they do. I bet that's great. And I've been doing this for 11 years now. I, it, the whole thing started as when they say, like, uh, with Walt, you know, it all began with the mouse. And it all began with a purchase on Amazon. And it became 
a social media for the original idea was that I wanted everybody to get a TARDIS and take pictures for where they were at. So a kid over in China would take a picture of their TARDIS at the Great Wall, and somebody in France would take it with the with the, with the Eiffel Tower. You know, it would just be oh, the unification. Great. But everybody likes the original, so I take him everywhere he can go, and he's I think he's had quite an entourage of people. Uh, actually, oh, oh, yeah, I mean. Just look at some of the pictures that show up right at the beginning of the show. It's wonderful with all those yeah. stars from Doctor Who alone. But it's not just the stars, too. I, I, the wonderful thing about this is w one woman who told me that they like the, the this idea is because they see the pictures of all these celebrities and stars, and they said they feel like they have a connection to mm -hmm. them. When they when they see this TARDIS and it's just like when they get a picture of it, they feel like they're connected. It's almost like one big Whovian family, and it just continues to grow. And it's not just Whovians that get a picture with it; it's uh, quite a few people that will. Yeah. Anybody who wants to get a picture with it, I, you know, I'll never turn them down. I'll just well, be like, hey, great. that's great. That's I think that's really good. Do you have an idea of how many pictures you've taken of that little TARDIS with people? The last time I checked, thousands. Wow. Be, a, yeah. I, I, I will let me do let me do this real fast. Um, let me see if I can find this. And this is just, yeah, Halloween Horror Night, Spooky Empire, uh, just people kind of just. What I'm trying to do here is, does this work? Did that work? I uh, didn't want that one. One second. Sorry. Sorry, Ian. Yeah, you see, yeah, that's uh, the studio that I use that just in case something should kerfluffle. I have this access to the studio. Um, I like to see the characters that people made up at the yeah. Halloween nights with the TARDIS, and uh, there's a crossover for you. Oh my God. That was not what I was expecting. <laughs> oh, there you go. That was something. Uh, yeah, come back. No, come I'm back having an issue. Have. It's well, I'm just uh, I'm trying one more time and see if it works. I don't know why it's not working the way I want to. Um, yeah, it's not doing what I do. Mm -hmm. There it is. We have this. There you go. Oh, so did you? Did, oh, you see it now? You see That's this great. now? Great, yeah. Yeah, and okay. There, there's Jason Isaacs who's playing um, uh, Cary Grant. Mm -hmm. Oh, that. Oh, he's going to be playing Cary Grant. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's. He looks. I mean, they really made it up. He got a special chin on him and everything. He looks wonderful. He does look like Cary Grant. He does. I, I, yeah. I'm glad you picked him. So, oh, Ian, wonderful. just to give you a thumbnail, there you are, right here at the bottom. Just to oh, give wow. you. This is just the celebrities who have come across this card. This Tardis. is amazing. This is amazing. Look at this. This is phenomenal. We lost him too soon. We lost David Warner way too soon. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I agree. Wow, wow. I mean, this is this, oh, this is extraordinary. Look at all these people. And we lost this gentleman way too soon, too. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. that was such a tragic thing. Yes. It really shows the interconnectedness that you're talking about. Yeah, and that's these are just connection. what people would consider the select. Oh, that's still going. <laughs> no, there's more. It's, it, this is great. This is great. This is really phenomenal. Wow, wow! You should be really, really proud of this. Mm -hmm. Look at this. This is just. These are just the celebs, right? These are just the celebs. I, I haven't you, even gotten into all the, these wonderful people. That is just great. Wow. And a lot of, you should be really chuffed. And a lot of them became friends. And that, yeah. that, that's the cool part about this. I'm they sure. I'm thing. sure. And it still goes on. <laughs> Good God. But this was just a little thing. If you can see like some of the pictures where it was just dark blue when it originally started. Um, the paint kept peeling off because it didn't have a primer on it. Everybody thinks it's cool that uh, Leave It to Beaver, Jerry Mathers got a picture of it, and there's John Cleese with it at the very bottom. So, 
I mean, they're wonderful stories to tell, but one of the best ones is John Cleese himself because, oops, sorry, I'm going to get rid of that. He didn't know what to do with it. He was holding on to the TARDIS and he was just posing with it. And I said, John, I will not accept that. And I'll take my money back if that's what you do. And he actually <laughs> looked at me funny and he goes, okay. And then that's exactly what he ended up doing. And that's mm -hmm. the pose that went on there. Wow. But. Well, you should be really chuffed with that amount of people. That's great. Yeah, well, you're all part of people, it. All those conventions you've been to. My goodness me. You're a part of it. A lot of conventions. And I bet you've worked with a whole bunch of them. Judging yeah, by I've worked with a lot of those people. Absolutely, yeah. We're very fortunate. Very fortunate to work with lots of them. Hmm. I don't yeah. want to to my own horn, but to see this is why I did. The same reason why you, you, you worked with the people that you have. Um, and this is my own little, I guess, hole in the corner in the universe that I, the universe that I carved out for myself. Ian, well, can we stop talking about me? <laughs> no, 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 we can't. We can't. I live a boring. I live a boring life. <laughs> I run a podcast. Come on, you live in the, a wonderful place to be. My goodness me, it's just down the road. Mm -hmm. We go to escapism and, and, and one easy go. Yeah, it's Lovely. great. That's the good thing about Florida. Everything's here. Universal, SeaWorld, uh, Disney, the airport, if I want to go yes, somewhere. Phenomenal. So and you need to come down. Too, right? bring, the, bring the family here. Yeah, bring the family. Well, folks, my party's starting. This is the real party right here. Yeah, this was. <laughs> but there's, no, the real there's no beer here. You have to bring beer. And I'll yes. bring the beer so thank you so much, Ian. Thank you. Enjoy your grilling of Christian. Ask him more questions. Yes, okay. Well, listen, I'm going to go to you. So listen, it's been great it. talking to you. And thanks for having me. And everybody, you, you got it. Everybody, uh, go right now. Ian's Cameo is at cameo.com slash Ian McNeese uh, for birthdays or parties or weddings or if you want somebody Ian to propose to your future fiance. Yes. This is the exactly. best. For, this is one of them. This is one of the best purpose you can use. So you can also oh, use Simon's Black game. Angus cattle. You're going to say goodbye. Black Angus cattle you know there. Uh, Ian, was there any last minute thoughts you before we go? Not at all. It's been really, it's been, been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. and I've enjoyed it very much. So thank you for having me. You got it. Everybody, please stay safe. Nick, thanks for it. Have an excellent party out there. Uh, as we wrap up uh, our show, please continue to stay safe. Again, uh, Ian and Simon's cameo are in the chats right now, and you can check them out out there, cameo.com slash fisherbecker1. You can subscribe right now, youtube.com, uh, The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. we got 71,000 Whovian followers. It's probably how many pictures we're having, and I'm not exaggerating in the, on that Facebook Amazing. page out there. And our radio show, Spotify, sci-fi.radio, wherever you listen to it. Uh, your favorite podcast. And don't forget, you better behave. We'll try to have an episode next week. We hope we do. If we don't, we've had two episodes this week, so we're just making up. Thank you to the lovely Ian McNeese out there. And just remember to behave yourselves because, you know what? They're watching for That's you. That's right. They're watching. <laughs> <laughs> They're watching. Everybody, please subscribe. Everybody, thank you so much. Have a great day. And don't forget to put your, uh, if you're just catching us now after the show, Put your uh, comments down in the chats. Johnny, take us out.